what it is. Life doesn't put anything in front of us that we can't handle. It's all in the handling. Coherent or incoherent. Clarity or chaos. Ani, Bougou, good day. I'm Spiro Manson, Pamela Chippewa from the Turtle Mountain Reservation in North Dakota and direct the Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Let me begin by sharing the words of an Athabascan elder from a February 2020 interview in Alaska, which I conducted. Once more, darkness descends upon our people and this land. It bears many names, smallpox, the flu, measles, typhoid, TB, today, a virus. Suffering and death always follow. Yet our traditions shine brightly, casting light to guide the way. We again struggle to survive, buoyed by these traditions, now armed as well with medicine and science, weapons of the Western world. The challenge is how to bring both to bear on this danger so we may live on. As these powerful words underscore, the novel SARS coronavirus 2 sweeping across our country has reawakened the fear, pain, stigma, and loss of past outbreaks of infectious diseases among American Indians and Alaska Natives. It amplifies fractures in the social fabric only recently covered over and exacts a terrible toll by exacerbating the health disparities that place us at added risk of sickness and death. You have had brief glimpses into these circumstances, largely through the eyes of the Diné, the Navajo Nation in the Southwest, and the Lakota of the Northern Plains. Most of this attention emphasizes challenges, namely our vulnerability, the heartbreaking battle to constrain contagion, the lack of resources to care for those afflicted by the virus, and the mounting consequences for individuals, families, and community. However, it's not simply a matter of survival, but of survivance, recapitulating a way of life that nourishes indigenous ways of knowing, this time extended by lessons from a contemporary pandemic. The virus has deeply penetrated tribal communities. As of mid-May 2020, American Indians comprised 18% of COVID-19 related deaths and 11% of coronavirus cases compared to 4% of the total population in Arizona. 57% of cases compared to 9% of the total population in New Mexico and 30% of cases compared to 2% of the total population in Wyoming. Within the same time frame, the Indian Health Service which we referred to as the IHS, reported 5,500 positive cases at its various facilities. The infection rate among the Diné surpassed the state of New York, the recent center of the U.S. pandemic, numbering 2,680 cases per 100,000 people compared to 1,890. Today, the Navajo Nation has the highest per capita incidence of COVID-19 infection in the U.S. despite draconian control measures. The situation is even worse among smaller tribes. According to the most recent data available from the CDC, in 23 states with adequate race ethnicity data, the cumulative incidence of laboratory confirmed COVID-19 among native people was 3.5 times that among non-Hispanic white persons. Unfortunately, a large percentage of missing data precludes analysis of a number of characteristics and outcomes. Such limitations severely compromise our ability to estimate COVID-19 incidence, severity, and outcomes among my people, and therefore thwart planning effectively in regard to its mitigation. And when we understand, our strength gets stronger. And when we don't understand, our weaknesses get stronger. It's an inevitability. The SARS 
Coronavirus 2 presents elevated risks for Native peoples who experience substantial health disparities. We suffer a disproportionately high prevalence of many health conditions that place us at greater risk for serious illness and death if we contract coronavirus, including diabetes, heart disease, asthma, and obesity. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention finds that 34% of American Indian and Alaska Natives less than 65 years of age are at risk of serious disease from coronavirus, compared to 21% of non-elderly white adults. Living conditions also place us Native people at increased risk for exposure to the disease. For example, compared to other groups, we're more likely to lack access to clean water and plumbing, and to live in substandard and crowded housing, thereby limiting our ability to practice frequent hand washing and social distancing. American Indians and Alaska Natives face barriers accessing health care that hinder testing and treatment. These barriers include lack of testing opportunities, limited awareness of those that may exist, constraints due to distance or inadequate transportation, fear, and stigma, as well as cost. The Indian Health Service is the primary vehicle through which the federal government fulfills its long-standing responsibility to provide primary health care services to us. However, the IHS has been chronically underfunded to meet our health care needs. Across the country, 25% of healthcare provider positions were vacant, with 30% of those vacancies alone in the Navajo Nation as of 2018. The Indian Health Service budget only provides $4,078 per capita for healthcare spending, less than half of what is spent for federal beneficiaries in the general population, and covers just 16% of the estimated funding needed to fully support all IHS federally operated, tribally operated, and urban Indian operated facilities. As the Athabascan elders' remarks remind us, American Indian and Alaska Natives are no strangers to epidemics. The current novel SARS coronavirus 2 crisis is one in a long history of deadly viruses to plague Native peoples. European arrival in the late 1400s and beyond introduced smallpox, bubonic plague, chickenpox, measles, diphtheria, influenza, malaria, scarlet fever, typhoid, tuberculosis, and pertussis, diseases to which Native people bore no natural immunity. The consequences were devastating, killing an estimated 90% of this population, with lingering effects such as social and cultural dislocation, historical trauma, and population migrations well into the 1960s. The power of intelligence clearly used is a way of seeing, curing, healing spirit. It's not about whether we can or can't. It's about whether we will or we won't. It is what it is. The smallpox epidemic of the 1830s is generally regarded as the deadliest of plagues to afflict Alaska's native people. Ravaging communities across that state, the epidemic wiped out entire villages, killing upwards of two-thirds of the Alaska native people living in the lower Yukon area alone. During the Spanish influenza pandemic of 1918, more than 80% of influenza deaths were among native people who comprised 48% of the total population in the state of Alaska. Likewise, the mortality rate of the disease was estimated to be four times higher among American Indians than for whites. Similar accounts can be readily found with respect to tuberculosis, which by the end of the 19th century had become a deadly health problem. American Indians accounted for 45 per 1,000 total deaths in Nevada, and up to six, 625 per thousand total deaths in New York, many fold greater than their non-Indian counterparts. Regardless of the infectious disease, history repeatedly has documented that Native people were highly vulnerable, 
suffered markedly from the consequences of contagion and died in excess than other segments of American society. But the consequences cannot be measured simply in terms of mortality alone. Infectious disease-related mortality contributed to enormous social and cultural upheaval among American Indians and Alaska Natives. Entire families, even tribal communities, were decimated. Many survivors experienced major, lasting disruptions. As was common among the poor, regardless of race, newspaper articles and personal stories about the Spanish influenza speak to Alaska Native and American Indian children relocated en masse to institutional settings far distant from their homelands, to which many never returned. The same media sources described the advent of sanitariums to address tuberculosis in the 1920s and 1930s. Fueled by government-funded campaigns, Native people were often sent to Seattle, Washington, Lapway, Idaho, Rapid City, South Dakota, and even Phoenix, Arizona, and other locations where they spent years housed in converted public health hospitals, vacated boarding schools, and even former jails awaiting a cure. Families dissolved, parenting skipped generations, cultural practices languished, and personhood and collective identity came under major assault. Not unlike today, blame the victim beliefs paraded then and now as explanations for our vulnerability to the ravages of these pandemics and difficulty in weathering the consequences. In the late 1800s to early 20th century, words like dirty and illiterate regularly appeared in newspaper accounts of the spread of smallpox, tuberculosis, and influenza among Native peoples. It is what it is, the blamers and the blamed the blamers and the blamed. play a dangerous game. Play a dangerous game. Turning responsibility into another one of their casualties. Before dismissing these attributions as belonging to a distant past, one only need cast back to the 1993 reports of the Hunter virus in the Southwest U.S. Initially known as the Navajo Plague, Four Corners Virus, and the CDC's label, Muerto Canyon Hunter Virus. Mouse droppings associated with its transmissions were linked to descriptions of reservation dwellings as, quote, filthy, squalid, and unhygienic, end quote. Stigma abounds now as it did then. This history deeply colors American Indian and Alaska Native views of the current COVID-19 crisis. We fear the social and cultural disruptions that history has shown to be close companions of outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. As a result, tribal communities today emphasize self-governance and tribal sovereignty and seek greater control over our lives, lands, and health care. During the current pandemic, the most vivid examples include the Diné and Cheyenne River Sioux blockades of roads leading into their respective reservation lands and special application required for admission to those lands. The differential response of the states that encompass these tribal lands illustrates new alliances and unfortunately old enmities. The governor of New Mexico strongly endorsed the Diné in their efforts at mitigation, working closely with the tribe to the benefit of both. In sharp contrast, the governor of South Dakota vehemently opposed Sioux measures to limit spread of the virus, threatening legal and even forcible intervention. In Alaska, with full support of local government, many native villages ended air flights into their communities in attempts to self-isolate and are only now cautiously opening up with borough and state assistance. The survivance of Native peoples is evident in other ways as well. Traditional healing practices have been mobilized to emphasize indigenous medicinal plants to address certain symptoms, to boost the immunologic system, and to emphasize self-care. 
Other traditions have been adapted to increase a sense of personal and group efficacy, yielding fresh approaches to social support, such as Diné Youth Caring for Elders, or native-owned Minneapolis restaurant providing meals of rabbit stew, venison, walleye, and wild rice to homebound American Indian elders. Biomedical practitioners have joined with traditional healers to demonstrate how current forms of mitigation, such as hand washing, social distancing, and wearing masks, can enable the latter to safely practice their healing rituals. Scholars, healthcare professionals, advocates, policymakers, and funders have a unique collective opportunity and obligation to join Native peoples in bringing to bear the strengths of tribal communities, of science, and of past and present day lessons from public health to battle this pandemic. Not only an opportunity, but also a moral imperative. We need to recognize the broader world of which all Americans are a part and to which we can contribute. This is a challenge we are capable of meeting. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm David Hayes Bautista, uh, Distinguished Professor of Medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and Director of the Center for the Study of Latino Health and Culture. And I would like to talk today about the issue of framing, framing Latinos, framing COVID. I'm a researcher, I'm a scientist, and I have learned that how we frame Latinos basically determines how we research them, the questions we ask, the items that we pick, the narrative lines that we draw. And I have serious questions about framing, both in science and in the media. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. Currently, Latinos are framed in a way that drives a lot of the media images. Uh, if we look at this quote from the current president when he was a candidate, and he claimed that Mexico was sending criminals, narcos, and rapists. And these images tend to stick in people's minds. Therefore, Latinos are usually seen as immigrants, recently arrived, dysfunctional, somewhat criminally intended, what I sometimes laughingly call the, the framing of Latinos as the illegal immigrant gang-banging teenage pregnant mom on welfare, and that's where then the problems began in doing research. Is that indeed an appropriate frame for Latinos? Interestingly enough, if we look at Latinos, the 60 million Latinos in the United States, here's a different way to frame Latinos as a gross domestic product, that is the Latino gross domestic product. We have been researching this and we've released three reports now. And the interesting and surprising thing for a lot of people is that if Latinos, the total value of all the goods and services produced by Latinos were reported separately from the rest of the United States GDP, Latinos in the United States, the 60 million Latinos have produced the world's eighth largest economy. Yes, eighth largest economy. It is big, bigger than, uh, Brazil, better, bigger than Italy, bigger than Russia, bigger than Mexico, following only the big ones like the United States, China, Japan, Germany, UK, France, India, and then the, United, the Latinos of the United States. So to think of it as the eighth largest economy gives us a different way to frame. Now, let's continue with this. How does a population of Latinos manage to produce such a large economy? 
Well, one of the ways is by producing tremendous growth. In fact, as we look at those top 10 GDPs in the world, the Latino GDP, again, considered separately from the rest of the United States, would be the third fastest growing GDP, faster than the rest of the United States, in fact. Now, does that start to give a different frame? How do Latinos manage to do this? Well, Latinos manage to do this by having an extremely high work ethic. As we look at this slide, the yellow bars represent from 2005 to 2017, we have almost 15 years of data, uh, the yellow bars represent Latino labor force participation, and the blue line represents non-Latino labor force participation. Now, you notice we had a little uh, bump up there during and uh, right after the recession of 2007-2009. And since 2010, basically the Latino labor force participation rate remains significantly higher and, in fact, creeps up just a little bit. However, ever since 2008, the non-Latino labor force participation rate has been steadily dropping lower and lower and lower. So by having an extremely hardworking population is how you produce such a healthy gross domestic product. Now let's turn to some other properties of Latinos that tend to come as a surprise to people because they don't fit our framing. However, these are based on nearly 40 years of data. Let's look at health, the health of Latinos. Latinos are often, again, framed as a sickly population. It's framed that they're recently immigrant. They come up, they cloud up the hospitals, etc. When in reality, what we in the health research world notice is what's called the Latino epidemiological paradox. If we look at the number one cause of death, which is heart diseases, the uh, non-Hispanic rate, which is in blue, at 164, deaths per 100,000. The Latino rate at 115 deaths per 100,000 is 30% lower. That is, Latinos have 30% basically fewer heart attacks compared to non-Latino. Now that surprises a lot of people because Latinos, yes, are a low income, low education group with poor access to care, but that's not unique to heart disease. In fact, as we look at cancer, the uh, non-Latino rate is a about 150, the Latino rate is 110, again, 30% lower. As we look at unintentional injuries, the Latino rate is in yellow, again, about 50% lower. And as we look at chronic lower respiratory disease, the Latino rate is 60% lower. In fact, if we pull all causes of death together, the Latino rate is 30% lower than the non-Latino rate. Now, what's interesting, there is one exception to this as a disease, and that is diabetes. That is the only cause of death for which the Latino rate is somewhat higher than the non-Hispanic rate. And the one thing most people know about Latinos is diabetes, diabetes, diabetes. And it's a far rarer cause of death. It's about the number seven cause of death in the United States. So we have framed Latinos by focusing on the one area where Latinos do not have a good profile and we forget to look at the rest of the health profile. And what's interesting and again, this surprises some people because Latinos have been framed as being unable to control their appetites. As you look at the use of tobacco, the Latinos in yellow actually have about a 30% lower tobacco use rate than non-Latinos. And as we look at use of alcohol, that's considered one or more drinks per month. Uh, Latinos have about 25% lower use rate of alcohol compared to non-Latinos. Now, we can understand that this starts to give us a different framing. What does this mean? Let's look at life expectancy at birth, which is probably the most important indicator when people look at the health of economies around the world. And for this indicator, Latinos at 81.8 years have nearly three year longer life expectancy than non-Latinos. So, works very hard, the highest labor force participation rate, very healthy behaviors, uh, very lower use of alcohol, tobacco, longer life expectancy. This is how you get the number eight GDP of the world. This shows that it's a cross section of the Latino population in California by five year age group. So each column represents five years, zero to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, etc. The blue portion of each column is the part that's born in the United States or is citizen and the orange is the part that is non-citizen. And if you look carefully at the younger age groups, zero to four, five to nine, 
10 to 14, etc. Those are 97% U.S. citizens, almost all born here. And as you look at the older age group, uh, from 65 and older, those are 78% citizen. In fact, the only age groups that have even a large minority of immigrants are in the middle age group, basically 35 to 49, 50 to 64. And at that, there are those two age groups are about 65% citizen, about 35% non-citizen. So actually, in California, overall, 80% of Latinos are U.S. citizens. That is, the vast majority are not recently arrived immigrants. And let's look at the data on the COVID age-specific death rates in California. This is for July. So yes, you notice that Latinos have the highest COVID death rate in the age 50 to 64 age group. In fact, it is approximately six times higher than the non-Hispanic white, and it's higher than any other group. Why would that be? Well, it's not because Latinos are a sickly population. It's because Latinos are employed in the essential jobs that keep the economy going, such as farm workers, for Pete's sake. Uh, if it weren't for farm workers, we wouldn't have food to eat. And if you remember the early days of the lockdown when people were fighting in the grocery stores over paper towels and toilet paper, I keep saying, if it weren't for farm workers, you would be fighting over the last sack of tomatoes in the store. Farm workers can't do their work at home. They have to be out in the field. They travel in crowded buses. They work shoulder to shoulder. They often sleep in barracks or crowded housing. They rarely are offered health insurance. They don't have access to care. So when they are told, oh, you have symptoms, uh, go call your doctor. They have no doctor to turn to. They have no insurance with which to pay. They don't have enough income to pay private rates. That is why we have a higher exposure rate. We have a higher case rate. We have a mortality rate. The farm workers, the truck drivers, the packing house workers, meat packers, uh, food industry clerks, automobile mechanics, truck drivers, construction workers, attendants in nursing homes. This is why Latinos have the higher case rate because they are out there being exposed far more than others who can shelter at home. That is why we have then this higher fatality rate because, I'm sorry, death rate, because they are more exposed. So Latinos have a very high case rate, but we need to reframe it in terms of because they are performing the essential jobs, fulfilling the essential jobs that keep us fed, keep a house, keep us clothed, keep things moving. And they are the ones paying the price because we pay them very little. We rarely offer them health insurance. There's a massive shortage of providers serving this population, and yet they are out there working day after day. So let's reframe Latinos from being a group of recently arrived immigrants who have difficulty doing anything right to the powerhouse that powers the growth in the U.S. GDP and has helped maintain the overall case rate down by making it possible for people to shelter at home. Thank you very much. Massachusetts. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to make a few remarks for Science Writers 2020. What a year uh, 2020 has proved to be for people who write about science. And I thought that I would, um, just to give you a brief outline of what my remarks will cover, I thought I would start out talking first about what we all recognize to be large racial and ethnic disparities in both infection rates with this novel coronavirus and in mortality. And uh, then talk about some work that I and colleagues at the School of Public Health at Harvard 
have done recently. I'm hopeful that it will soon be available in a peer-reviewed journal, but it's now available as a white paper that shows the very uh, high excess relative risk of death for, uh, for young uh, Black, Latino, and Indigenous people. Now, of course, a critical part of showing data is getting across an explanation for it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the explanations can be, or what I would argue should be, for racial and ethnic variations in both risk of infection and risk of dying of infection. And then I'm gonna uh, just take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the role of journalists as translators of science, which is, probably the principal role that you, uh, who, you journalists who work as science writers have, um, have taken on. Uh, but uh, in these times, you've become more than translators. You've become defenders of science. And then last, I'm not going to pass up on the opportunity to um, hold forth a little bit about stories that I think you know, should be told as they are coming up or stories that I think you should just keep telling and should not become, quote, old news. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And, uh, and it's, you know, as you know, uh, in these times, it's a bit strange to talk without any ability to connect with your audience, but I'm very grateful for your attention. Now, the Next thing to point out is when it comes to racial and ethnic disparities in health, it really was particularly the print media, but later also the um, uh, television and radio that brought attention to the em evolving uh, differences in mortality rates. Um, if you look at the headlines uh, of some of the major newspapers, uh, the uh, fact that Blacks have excess mortalities were making it top of the fold, major headline. And uh, this was before there were federal data uh, to help us. Uh, these were data not just coming from the big national newspapers, but data coming from uh, smaller newspapers. The first paper that I'm aware of that told the story of excess mortality among African Americans uh, was the Milwaukee newspaper. They published a paper at the end of March. Now remember, the very first uh, diagnosed case or reported case of um, COVID-19 in the United States was in, in January. And we had our first death reported at the end of February. So it was just a month after the first death had been reported that um, Milwaukee noted an excess of African-American deaths. There had just been 15 deaths statewide, uh, but and eight of them in the city of, uh, of Milwaukee. And all eight of those deaths were among African-Americans. And then other cities followed, Chicago, um, the state of Wisconsin, uh, Atlanta, and other uh, local jurisdictions, and the newspapers carried it. And that was the first information that we had. And it was an example of what's been true throughout this pandemic, that journalism has stepped into the void uh, left by the absence of public health leadership so that one was more likely to turn to the newspapers for the best graphics, the best data analysis, uh, than one was to turn to the web pages of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which is our national um, uh, public health authority. And uh, I really have to pay tribute to this. Of course, we pay tribute to the health workers who kept at their posts and continued going to work but I also really want to pay tribute to the journalists who kept digging. Uh, in some cases, had to, uh, had to file uh, freedom of information requests in order to get the data and kept presenting the data in fresh, dramatic, and provocative ways. Uh, there are data that are animated. 
there are data that are maps. Uh, there are data that are graphs. Um, and all of these are really important ways of translating science. But in this case, it was absolutely just making the science available. So what um, did the data show? Well, uh, in, it was sometime in May that national data that included race uh, became available for the first time. Uh, so before that time, uh, the federal government had been making data on COVID mortality available only by age and uh, gender. And so for the first time, we got um, data available by race and age so that we could look at racial differences in specific age groups. Uh, and we uh, decided um, at the School of Public Health to take a look at whether or not there were differences in age-specific mortality. This was an important question because the New York City Health Department, uh, the department that I was privileged to lead as commissioner, uh, didn't release its data among the first cities, which I was sorry about, but it did release data that were age-adjusted. For the, uh, for the first time, we saw age-adjusted data. And I don't know whether any journalists picked up on this. I'm guessing that, that, you, that science writers are often themselves uh, trained in science and uh, picked up on the fact that when age adjustment was done, there were very large changes in the estimate of the mortality rate. Uh, for Blacks and Latinos, it went up by about a third. Now, the reason that age adjustment is important is because, and this is obvious, the, the um, risk of dying varies with age. So, of course, there's a very high risk early in life, and then our risk starts going up and up as we get older. So if you are comparing a population that is largely older, they're at a time in which they are more likely to die. And if you're comparing them to a younger population, you would expect by virtue of its age structure, the younger population to have a lower mortality rate. And unless you take into account the age structure, you won't figure that out. So the age adjustment done by New York City suggested that there were uh, very large differences in, uh, in age structure and possibly in the risk of death at any given age. So this is the, um, the work that we undertook. Um, and the data showed some pretty dramatic findings. Now, for most people, uh, most groups, all groups, uh, the risk of dying of COVID-19 is highest among older people. So that most deaths occur uh, in people over the age of 65. Uh, but the proportion of the population that has died over the age of 65 varies significantly by race, ethnic group. The U.S. Census acknowledges five groups. There are whites, uh, who are called non-Hispanic whites. Uh, there are people we call black, and technically that's non-Hispanic black. Then Hispanics, um, uh, um, Native American Indians or Alaska Natives and Asians and Pacific Islanders, both of whom also have the caveat that they're non-Hispanic. And uh, in all groups, the larger share of deaths occur over the age of 65. But for whites, this proportion is 90% uh, of deaths. Whereas for um, example, for uh, the indigenous uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives as they're formally labeled in the census, it's uh, under 60% of deaths occur after the age of 65. And that's why we decided we would look separately in age groups. And we found that for young adults between the ages of 25 and 54, as compared to whites, uh, for uh, African Americans uh, and Latinos, the uh, relative risk of dying ranged from five to seven fold. And for example, for one age group, 
35 to 44. The risk of dying uh, for an African American in that age group, male or female, this was not a gender specific um, analysis, was ninefold higher. So in plain language, uh, what that rate ratio means is that for a person who's African American, uh, who get who um, between the ages of 35 and um, and 44, uh, they have a ninefold higher chance of dying of COVID compared to a person who's classified as white. So this is a really uh, stunning figure, and it brings me to the third point that I want to talk about, um, which is our explanations of of why we see these racial and ethnic disparities. They're basically two general approaches that have been taken historically, uh, which I would argue both of which are wrong, uh, to explain why Blacks, uh, in particular because uh, Black Americans are the most studied of the uh, minority racial ethnic groups in the United States, there are two basic explanatory models. One says that there's a genetic difference um, between uh, blacks and whites. Uh, in other words, uh, there's something intrinsic and biological that explains these variations in any number of common diseases, and in this case would explain the variation in COVID. Um, the other argument is that there are certain cultural attributes um, or behaviors that characterize groups uh, by race that explain their differences in disease risk and in health outcomes. So both of those uh, put the, the um, locus of the risk within the individual. Either it's in your genes or it's in your behavior. And then the alternative uh, construct, which increasingly we're hear hearing used in, uh, in the media, uh, as well as among academics and even politicians, are arguments that these differences are structural in origin and have to do with the kind of risks um, that people face in the options available to them. So let me return to the question, why are we seeing um, a three to a four-fold higher risk of dying of COVID-19 uh, among African Americans and a similarly high risk, uh, one that seems to be going up, by the way, uh, among uh, Latinos, and uh, um, although the numbers are very small, uh, of the indigenous population, it, 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 it's a, a, a now a tiny fraction of the U.S. population. Uh, these similar um, estimates, although they're unstable because of small numbers of increased risk. Why, why are we seeing this? And our age-specific data um, suggest at least one explanation that we're seeing an excess of deaths among young, uh, among, uh, uh, young adults. It, it's not just among older adults, and people who are working age. And I would argue that, that this points to the important role of uh, being an essential worker um, and being a low-wage essential worker. Uh, a, somebody who um, has been required to continue working, for example, people who uh, work in, in meat packing under kind of assembly line conditions and where we know there was, uh, because of the media, uh, we know that there was rapid and lethal spread of, uh, of the novel coronavirus. <laughs> their businesses are open, and if they don't go to work, they won't get paid. And if they don't get paid, they can't support their families, pay their rent. 
um, and, uh, and, and, and live. So they go to work because they need the money. So essential workers are not a small part of our workforce. They are a large part of our workforce. Uh, something like 40% of the U.S. workforce was characterized as essential. And additionally, uh, disproportionately, these are low-wage uh, jobs that are fulfilled by, um, by people of color, uh, people who are, are black or Latino. explanation and I think it's important to uh, make that clear because it wasn't the initial reaction that we saw from the federal government. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember um, the uh, reaction of, of Dr. Tony Fauci who is a very beloved and um, eminent scientist uh, and a courageous uh, individual. Um, who always uh, sticks to science in his assessments. But when he was asked, uh, how do you think about these differences, he uh, referenced comorbid conditions. Health disparities have always existed for the African-American community. But here again, with the crisis, how it's shining a bright light on how unacceptable that is, because yet again, when you have a situation like the coronavirus, they are suffering disproportionately, as Dr. Burke said correctly. It's not that they're getting infected more often. It's that when they do get infected, their underlying medical conditions, the diabetes, the hypertension, the obesity, the asthma, those are the kind of things that wind them up in the ICU and ultimately give them a higher death rate. Now, Comorbid conditions means uh, things that we now know are risk factors for if you get COVID-19 having a bad outcome, and they include any number of chronic diseases, and they include obesity, which is not a disease but predisposes people to heart disease and diabetes and having underlying lung disease, asthma. All of these show um, racial ethnic variation with a higher risk among people who are classed as black and Latino. So, you know, they get infected, they die. And, uh, you know, we can't really fix diabetes tomorrow, uh, nor can we, uh, you know, correct heart disease. So he, his reaction was, you know, we can't fix these underlying conditions. We should understand better uh, when this is all over, uh, which we're all hoping for. Uh, why we see these racial disparities, but for now all we can do is look after them. And I'm paraphrasing, but it was something along those lines and, and didn't raise the uh, fact that uh, people were living in crowded housing, traveling on crowded transport, and going to workplaces where they very likely uh, lacked uh, worker protection. So we all know, for example, that nursing homes, uh, workers in nursing homes, uh, were kind of just barely thought of as health workers. And so that when there were concerns about ensuring that people have protective gear, uh, the personal protective equipment was not made available to these workers, many of whom traveled around to different nursing homes and worked very low wage jobs. So I, uh, so this is just to remind us all, and I would be speaking in the same way to a public health audience, that the facts are never just the facts, uh, that the facts also include what we need to understand about those facts. And I would urge science writers not to shy away from the importance of contextualizing facts. And I, I can't complain uh, because I, I would say that the coverage of the predicament of, of uh, food service workers, of nursing home aides, of uh, people working in warehouses, uh, in terms of their ability to protect themselves from COVID um, was well covered in the press. And this was a very important role because it made clear that part of the problem is exposure. Th this is very important because it makes clear that we have to 
uh, focus not on exposure and not just on the uh, risk of the outcome. And that we need the public to understand that the first step on having a fatal case of COVID-19 is getting infected. And then the next step is how your body yeah, can handle that infection and what kind of supportive treatment you get because we don't really have a repertoire of established effective treatments. So that uh, talking about exposure to COVID and reducing that is the most important thing that we can do in terms of changing the pandemic. And that is, um, is what we should look to uh, because it's true. We can't change diabetes and we can't change uh, heart disease, but we could protect our workers better. Contextualizing facts is really important. And I, I um, and, and they have to do with the structure of our country and the way in which our economy is structured, about the fact people don't have paid sick leave, they don't have health insurance. Uh, all of these are outside of the usual kind of repertoire that healthcare workers talk about, but it's what's been driving the, um, the terrible facts that we know. I'm talking to you now as the U.S. races to 200,000 deaths. Uh, the world is, um, you know, is racing um, to nearly 30 million um, cases and nearly a million deaths. Uh, this is um, not something that was prepared for, uh, but the origins of our vulnerability are very long-standing. And of course, we aren't hearing enough from public health uh, about this. If I want to get the facts on where we stand in terms of numbers, I turn to a university webpage. Before that, I used to look at the webpage of a high school student who put this together in Washington State where he lives on Mercer Island. Uh, if I want a daily briefing on uh, where we stand in the world, I turn to the World Health Organization. There is no equivalent national structure. And we also know that public health has been um, suffering a, a rash of resignations of its leadership at local and state levels that is truly unprecedented. Uh, I, I read that nearly 50 heads of local and state health departments have left their jobs, and some of them have received death threats. Uh, for talking about wearing a mask. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, Dr. Fauci re has reported that not only he, but his family members have received death threats. So this is where you have to keep telling the science story. We all need to know it. We need to know, uh, you know how science evolves, how our understanding of the clinical uh, manifestations of this Virus said six months ago, all of us had, had had barely heard of and which had not yet been named or was just about to be named. Um, so, you know, our knowledge is evolving as it should. And it is an important role to convey that science is never a finished product, that it always is dependent on the growth of human knowledge and that learning more is not changing your mind and being wishy-washy. Uh, it is the way science works. And I, um, I also uh, think that it's important that you just continue to place the science front and center. Uh, the story on a vaccine is going to be very important um, because that is the answer uh, for, um, for you know, most um, epidemic um, diseases. That's one of the miracles of the 20th century. And we, we need to all feel confident about this process and we're reliant on science writers and science journalists. And um, I also, you know, I'm thinking about the stories that I think should keep being told. Um, one of them, of course, 
is to keep telling the story about racial and ethnic disparities. This is unjust. It's preventable, I would argue. And it's a story that should not get old. Uh, but it's not only people of color who have low-wage jobs. I would love to know more about what's happening to everyone in the United States who has a high school education or less. How are they faring? Because these are the people who have uh, have these precarious and low-wage jobs. And it would help all of us, I believe, to understand that the risk is also being borne by low-income whites and not only low-income people of color. Of course, low-income is, uh, is experienced far more often by people of African descent, uh, Latinos, uh, indigenous people rooted in our history and related to ongoing structural racism. But uh, this isn't the only group. I can't look at these right now because uh, information on edu educational attainment is not being made available. We just have race by age. Um, we don't even have gender. I would love to be able to look at race, age, and gender, but we don't have that. And we should be able to get educational attainment. It's on the, on the death records. That's how the whole deaths of despair analysis was done, but we don't have it. We need um, writers to keep talking about the importance of the data, uh, to keep centered the importance of science, of discovery, of advancing and sometimes shifting knowledge. focused on kids as well, uh, because uh, none of us know what the right answer is with respect to schools. Um, and I think it's going to be really important to see how that story unfolds. But I'd like to conclude by saying how important it is um, that you keep doing the great work that you're doing, that at the moment you're not only translators of science, you're its defenders as well. So thanks very much for your attention and uh, have a great meeting.